All right, welcome everybody. Um, today we're going to talk about um, hearing loss, or rather the impact of sound pressure level on your hearing system, uh, which hopefully is of concern to you. Uh, what the, the sort of plan, if you're following along the syllabus, remember I got us a day ahead now. So uh, Friday, we, I've gained us an extra day on Fridays. What, what we'll do is we'll um, go up to Pierce Building, where my office is, and we'll do hearing tests. Okay? Uh, and you'll see what the results of that look like. I'll show you some of mine here in a minute. Uh, so next Friday, don't meet here. Meet over in Pierce Building, up on the second floor where my office is. Okay? Um, so let's talk about this. Before we can really figure this, figure out what's going on here, we need to kind of understand a little bit about the ear and how it works. Now I will preface all of this by saying this is not my area of expertise, but I know a little bit about how this works, and uh, I know the parts that are relevant to our discussion today. So um, essentially what happens here, if you've never really studied this, uh, we know about sound pressure waves, right? That, that go up through the air. Well, they, they go in through your ear canal. And interestingly enough, as I kind of hinted at last week, this ear canal is a resonant chamber. Just like we've, we've learned about resonance, right? It's, it's a pipe that is closed at, both end, or at one end. And so there is, you know, it, it will naturally resonate certain frequencies. And it just tends to resonate frequencies that uh, are important to us for intelligibility. Uh, what happens is that pressure wave pushes against this thing called the tympanic membrane, otherwise known as your eardrum. And when that, it'll move sympathetically with that sound pressure wave. And when that happens, there are these bones. Oops, come back. Come back. <coughs> Let's use the pen so I won't do that. Uh, so there are these bones that, you know, move back and forth. It's like a little lever. Uh, that's what, you know, these, they're called the ossicles. Uh, the malleus, the incus, and the stapes, I think is? Stapes, I don't know. Uh, and that, that vibration of those bones uh, excites um, the fluid, really is not happy with me today, um, inside of your cochlea, which is this little like snail shell looking thing. Um, it's really not doing well today. I'll just stop touching the screen. How about that? Um, now inside the cochlea, I, I, you, I didn't get an illustration of that, but uh, it's, it's, it is a sort of resonant chamber of its own. Um, and what it's primarily trying to do is, is in your cochlea there are all of these little hairs. okay? Um, and the hairs are of different lengths. And when these hairs vibrate, uh, they send an impulse down this audio vestibular nerve, uh, which goes into your brain, and your brain then interprets those impulses as sound. Okay, now the hairs that vibrate, that are decide to vibrate, are the hairs that are sort of sympathetic from a point of view of resonance to the frequencies that you're hearing. So, in reality, when you're hearing a complex tone, you'd have lots of little hairs vibrating, right? And all those impulses sort of sum together to that. What the, that signal that tells your brain you've heard something. So uh, that's essentially how this works. The other, th the other thing of note is this, this eustachian tube uh, that comes in behind your ear canal. This is sort of part of your sinus. Uh, what's interesting about that is we, we know that you know, sound is an air pressure wave, right? Uh, and air has to be able to move in order <coughs> sound to happen. And so that's what this eustachian tube does, is it allows air to, otherwise, you know, if, if, there, if there was no way for the air to release through there, then your eardrum wouldn't move sympathetically with your eardrum. And uh, that's why when you get, you know, sort of congested in your sinuses, that, that includes this area here. And so the, the air flow is kind of impeded in your ears. That's why you, you tend to not hear as well when you're congested in your sinuses, okay? Uh, and some people uh, get, you know, these fill up all the time for some people, and they end up, they get ear infections all the time, and they end up, uh, you can get these surgically, you know, artificial ones surgically implanted. Have you ever heard putting tubes in your ears? Have you ever heard that? As? Yeah. Okay. You have them. Okay. Uh, so, 
Oh, not anymore. So they, they basically, you know, get just a little drinking straw, essentially, <laughs> right? And they, you know, insert that in here, you know, artificially to maintain that, because other, otherwise, you, you know, you can't hear. So uh, what are the parts of this that are helping you? Um, you know, your, your hearing system has some built-in protections to protect you from, you know, loud sounds. Well, why is it that loud sounds could hurt you? Well, essentially, you can overexert some of these things, right? Just like you could overdrive a loudspeaker, right? If you make it push too far, it'll jump out and break the little surrounds and everything. Same thing can happen to your eardrum, right? So if you, if you overexert that, it'll rupture, OK? That doesn't happen real often. I mean, it happens, but that's, that's on, the, on the scale of like things that are likely to happen to your hearing system, that's pretty low on that scale. You'd have to really have some do something major, but that's possible to do. Um, and the reason why I say it, it's, it's, it's unlikely is because there are systems in place to protect that from happening. So these bones, just like every other bone in your body, has muscles attached to it, and those muscles control how that bone is able to move. And so there are muscles attached to those ossicles, and they can clamp down on them to slow or impede their ability to move. And that, can, that is a protection system. So that as uh, s s uh, noise gets really loud that could potentially be damaging to you, those muscles will clamp down on those bones and make it so that your, you know, your eardrum can't move as much. And essentially, it reduces the attenuation. So those muscles clamping down on those bones give the effect of the sound being quieter, right? Because it doesn't allow the full excursion to happen. However, like any muscle, it can get tired, OK? You use a, a muscle too much for too long, and it eventually is not able, you know, loses its strength. And mu muscles can't work forever. Um, and so that system is meant to be a temporary you know, defense. It's not meant to be a long-term defense, because you know, the muscle just can't be engaged all that time. So uh, what, what happens is if you're exposed to really loud sounds for a long enough time, eventually those muscles get tired and they just have to relax. Uh, and then that protection is gone. Uh, and, and now you're in danger of, of all kinds of things. Um, what then tends to happen, as I understand it, is the things that, other than rupturing your eardrum, what, what really happens is inside that cochlea, you can overexert those little hairs. Okay, you can essentially kill them. Uh, and those are, the, interesting enough, I'm pretty sure that's the only hair in your body that doesn't grow back, uh, are those hairs in the cochlea. Mm -hmm. So, so the hairs are in the cochlea? Yeah. So once you kill those, they don't come back. And they'll even fall off and float away. And, and what that means is you don't get to hear that frequency anymore <laughs> for the rest of your life. Um, there's no coming back from that. Um, Bruno was talking uh, in, in Bruno's um, psychology of music and sound. He goes mm -hmm. over all this at the start, and he was talking about how they found this uh, tribe of people in Africa. I thought it was hilarious, but it, they basically all their hair was perfectly limp, mm -hmm. and they couldn't hear anything. Interesting. That included all the hairs inside of their ears. Interesting. They were all perfectly limp, so they were all the equivalent of like destroyed. Right. Interesting. So. So at any rate, that can happen. The other thing that sometimes happens is sometimes those hairs kind of get stuck. And they're, they're not quite dead, but they're not quite fully functional either. And they kind of get stuck. And, what, and they, they get stuck sending an impulse. Have you ever hear, heard like yeah. the ringing in your ears? Oh my gosh. Or it's sometimes called as uh, tinnitus, uh, where tinnitus, yeah. tinnitus people live with that their whole life. So what that means is you've damaged some hairs in your ear, in, in your cochlea, in such a way that they're kind of stuck on. <laughs> and they're just constantly sending this impulse to your brain that this frequency is there. It's not there. It's really, it's just tricking your brain into thinking it's there. And it's very frustrating because, again, no fix for that. Yeah. yeah you I can't do anything about that. I don't know if I'm just nuts, but like I can't, I, I can't sleep without the sound of the fan or something. Yeah. Because when I'm in silence, I like, it's not like a ringing, mm -hmm. but I like, I don't know, it's something about being in silence that my ears don't like. Yeah, and so that, that's really the only way to combat that kind of that problem is you can't get rid of the ringing. Um, at least we haven't figured out how to do that yet. There's some experimental therapy with magnets. That yeah. Because it's, it's, it's like partially in your head. Like it's like when you burn a thing into a TV screen. So it's like right. partially the physical and partially like 
right? right. So there, there's a lot that this is like something people are chasing down because this would be a really great thing to figure out how to fix, right? And so there's a lot of research out there that are trying all kinds of interesting things. You can get artificial cochlea <laughs> implanted into your head. Uh, you may have seen people with these uh, uh, cochlear implants. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, these little things that are stuck in their sight, right? Um, and what those are is, is they're, they're like hearing aids, sort of, but what they do is, that is, that is instead of amplifying the sound, they actually just hook, my understanding is they hook straight into this nerve and uh, you know, artificially send the impulses, uh, which is pretty slick. Um, so anyway, there's all kinds of research going on and things people are trying to, to, help to fix this, but so far, it's still not entirely curable. So this is the bad news about hearing loss, is once you lo lose some element of your hearing, you cannot get it back. There's no way to get it back. So you sort of get one chance <laughs> with your hearing system. And if you blow it, you're done, OK? Uh, which means if you would like to keep your hearing system <laughs> for the rest of your life, you should protect it and guard it against things that could harm it. Uh, from the point of view of, of going into a career where you have to listen to things for your, your career and, and make judgments on how things sound, uh, that's pretty important, right? The ability to hear and, and analyze what you're hearing and, and trust it and know that that translates to other people is, is very important. But the problem is your job is to listen to stuff. And what happens is, you know, based on the couple of things I've explained to you at the moment, you can, you can kind of see that really what damages your hearing is time. It's exposure to loud things over time because, you know, those muscles will relax and then you get exposed to this. Those muscles can only protect you for so long and then they stop and then now you're exposed to this noise full blast. So it's, so it's, a, it's, there's, it's unlikely that any single instant is going to cause you permanent hearing damage. Okay, your, your hearing system is designed to protect you from, you know, sort of accidental. <clears throat> I just something loud just happened around me. You know, it it it, can, it has mechanisms to an extent that can deal with that. But you expose it to loud things over and over and over again over a long period of time, it'll go down. Well, that's what you're going to do for your living, <laughs> right? Is expose your hearing system to potentially loud noises over long periods of time, over the next 30 years of your life or more. So this is sort of like an occupational hazard of going into sound professionally is that you need your hearing system to do it, but by virtue of doing it, you will destroy your hearing system. Okay? So we will all probably retire with hearing aids. <laughs> okay? it's, pr just, it's probably going to happen. Uh, what we would like to do is prolong that inevitability uh, and push that as far into the future as possible, right? So that it happens long after we've retired, okay? Uh, so that's what we're going to talk about today is how can you protect your hearing system in such a way that you can prolong this damage for as long as possible. So let's take a look at uh, what this looks like over time. So these are, uh, th this is how we measure this thing. These, they're called audiograms. So you, when you take a hearing test, you're usually put inside of kind of some sort of isolated room. So we'll use our little recording booth. And you put little headphones on. And uh, has anyone ever done this? Yeah. So the one we have is a little button. So uh, it like puts little tones in your ear, just little sine waves. But it's very, very quiet. Um, and it starts very quiet, and it slowly increases the level. And then whenever, when it gets loud enough to where you can hear it, you click the button. Okay? And it just keeps doing that. And it does lots of different frequencies. And it'll go back and do the other ones again just to make sure that you're still hearing at the same level. And, and based on your responses, it can generate this graph. And this graph is um, you know, basically when you click the button based for every frequency. The zero is like the baseline. Uh, I'm not sure. At one point, I, I read about what that is, but that's a certain SPL that um, you know they've defined as normal. Uh, and so, this is a hearing test I took in 2007 with my right ear, uh, and you can see that for the most part, I'm within 10 dB. 
uh, across the, the spectrum that they analyzed. Now, uh, remember, we know that our hearing system is not flat, right? We do not hear every frequency equally. So you would expect to see, you know, a, a reduction as you get to lower frequencies. Now, I'm, this is only measuring down to 500, but, you know, if it went further, it might even go, the sensitivity would go down a little bit. Um, what you really want to see is this nice kind of hump right here in this between that 2 and 4K range, because that's, those are the frequencies that contribute most to intelligibility. And so somebody with, with good, healthy hearing is probably going to look like that, okay? It's going to be kind of plus or minus 10 dB um, and a nice little hump like that in those uh, mid-high frequencies. Well, fast forward nine years later, nine years later of me doing sound for a living, and I took another hearing test last year in my right ear, and here's what I've got now. Now, this hearing test, I, we, I, I was able to, with the one that we have, measure more than you know more frequencies this one only measured six frequencies whereas this one did one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven frequencies uh, but notice the main difference look at that 6k okay so in 2007 that 6k was a little bit below 10 that, that maybe let's let's say it's minus 15 maybe okay well nine years later I, my sensitivity to 6K has dropped 10 dB. Um, and I took the test more than once to confirm this. And every time it came out that 6K in my right ear is my ability to hear that has diminished by 10 dB. Um, so if something happened, I don't know what happened. <laughs> I've been thinking, and I'm pretty good about, I, I am religious about wearing earplugs and protecting myself from loud sounds and all that. And, Something over the last nine years that I did over and over and over again has caused damage to my right ear at six kilohertz. Now, I'm still within that zero to minus 10 dB range everywhere else, and in my left ear, it's fine. So my left ear looks pretty, looks about the same as it did nine years ago. So something I've done to my right ear. The only thing I can think of is that I run, I've been running a lot in the last several years, and I run on the left side of the road like you're supposed to, and I'm wondering if it's like the noise from cars or something. It's the only thing I can think of. Um, that I've been doing differently, you know. So, you know, this is not the end of the world. Uh, it's just a thing, and I know it now. I know that in this side of my ear, I should not get too worked up about whether about what 6K sounds like. I'll just kind of, if, I need, if I'm trying to EQ something and I'm doing on that range, I'll just kind of do it with my left ear, you know. But I know this now about my, hear, about my ears, and so I just sort of compensate for that. But I would fully expect nine years later that there would probably be other sort of bits of damage there like that. Now what you really don't want to see is suddenly big dips in this, again, 2K to 4K range. Because that uh, is very damaging from a quality of life point of view. Uh, because that's when you stop being able to understand what people are saying. Uh, and you see somebody, if you looked at the audiogram of somebody who had significant hearing damage, that's what you'd see, is you would see a huge, starting at 1K, a huge drop off. Um, because it's the high frequencies that go first, usually. Because um, we're less sensitive to the low frequencies, naturally. So it's the high ones that we, that we lose. Uh, so that's just an example of somebody, like myself, who works very hard to protect my hearing. Uh, and yet, <laughs> even I have suffered some noise-induced hearing loss. Okay? So now imagine if I, what, what this might look like if I hadn't been religious about wearing earplugs and uh, been very careful about measuring the noise environments I was in everywhere I went, and which is what I have an app on my phone that does this. And I, every, if I get into an environment that I feel is a little noisy, I measure it and I see what's going on here. And, and I, there's graphs I'll show you in a minute that can tell you, like, is this to the extent to which this might be harmful to you? I do this all the time. So somebody who, who works really hard, you know, this happens. And so now imagine if I hadn't, what it could be quite a bit worse. So uh, this is you now. So uh, you know you. You're hopefully um, going to do this for a while, and uh, you will be exposed to a lot of the same things I was exposed to. And at the moment, I would imagine you probably aren't very conscientious about protecting your hearing. Uh, probably not to the extent that I am, yet. Okay. And so hopefully I can use use me as a somewhat cautionary tale that if it can happen to me, it can happen to you, okay? So uh, how, do we how do we talk about this? How do we measure this thing? 
Well, uh, there's been a, a, some research gone into this to try to figure out what are some guidelines for dealing with this. Uh, and the, the first kind of thing that was published was back in 1983 by OSHA. And you know, OSHA is, you know, OSHA is a very kind of political thing um, because it's, it, they, it's a regulatory or organization. They regulate business, okay, and, and the way business has to keep their employees safe. So, you know, this is a regulation that then gets enforced. So there, there's some conflicts of interest there a little bit because, uh, you know, on the one hand, we want to make sure workers are protected, but on the other, other hand, we don't want to impede business, right? Because that could impact our economy. So this is a, a challenge we, any, every country has, right? To what extent do we regulate business to protect people? And to what extent do we try not to regulate it so that business can thrive and all of that? And sometimes those are in conflict. So anyway, OSHA published some stuff. And, and, and the, the idea here is thinking about this in a, from a, on a day-to-day -day basis and thinking about noise exposure as a dose. Like you have been dosed with noise. Okay, and what would represent a 100% dose of noise for a day? In other words, uh, an amount of noise that would be, you could listen to this much noise and be safe, but nothing more than this much. So once you, once you have exposed yourself to this much noise, you then don't get to hear anything else the rest of the day or you may run, run the risk of damaging your hearing. Okay, this is, this is the concept. So here's kind of a chart they put together of 100% doses what, at various levels. So they started with 90 uh, dB SPL A-weighted, and they said, well, based on you know, the research that we're doing and, and things we've, we've figured out, we feel comfortable saying that you, know, you could be exposed to a 90 decibel SPL A-weighted uh, noise for eight hours, and that would be your 100% dose. Now, what's significant about that eight hours? Why, is, why do they choose eight hours? It's like a, pretty much a general work day. It's an eight-hour work day, right? Remember, this is Occupational uh, Health or Safety and Health Administration, right? They're trying to regulate the business. They can't regulate what people do at their homes, but they can regulate what they do at work, right? And so uh, it's eight hours. Uh, so they said you could be exposed to 90 dB SPL A-weighted for eight hours, and that would be 100% dose. You'd be safe. But that doesn't account for the other 16 hours in your day <laughs> when you're not at work and presumably also hearing things. <laughs> when it's not their problem, right? So that's the important thing to keep in mind about this. Yes, you could theoretically be exposed, according to OSHA, to 90 dB SPL A-weighted for eight hours and be safe. But that means you have to somehow block and shut off your entire hearing system for the other 16 hours, or you will risk um, damage to your hearing. Uh, and it gets worse as you get louder, of course. So when you go up to 95 dB SPL, they say, well, you can only do that for four hours safely. Uh, and that would be your 100% dose. Uh, you go up to 100 dB SPL, two hours for 100% dose. 105 dB SPL, one hour for 100% dose. 110 dB SPL, 30 minutes is the most that they're saying you could, you could hear that without running risk, uh, assuming, again, that you don't listen to anything else for the rest of the 23 and a half hours that day. <laughs> okay. Uh, 115 dB SPL, 15 minutes is it. Then you're, you're, you're tapped out at that point. Uh, now, just to, well, before I get into this, let, now, there's another organization, the National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health. Uh, they are not a regulatory uh, organization. They're just they're sort of a research organization. Uh, so they're not caught up in all the politics of this. Uh, and they, they put out recommendations, right, and research and things. But whereas OSHA is, is something, they put out something that then is regulated and enforced, uh, uh, NIOSH is, they're just saying, well, you know, here's what we think. So in some ways, I sort of trust them a little bit better than I trust the OSHA standard because there's less conflicts of interest tied up in that. Uh, and when they published their data in 1998, they were quite a bit more conservative in their estimations of, of noise exposure. Uh, and so from a regulatory point of view, if you're trying to enforce noise exposure at a business like the scene shop at the theater company you're working at or whatever, I mean, you know, the minimum they have to, they have to meet is this OSHA standard. 
But the NIOSH standard is probably a, a, a bit loftier goal that any business ought to aspire towards. And certainly, from a point of view of what sort of standard you're going to place upon yourself, I would err on the side of being a little conservative <laughs> in, the, in the, noises you're, you, the noise levels you expose yourself to. Okay, So they said that, in their op opinion, uh, an 8-hour, 100% dose would be 85 dB SPL A-weighted. And whereas OSHA went up in 5 dB increments, these guys go up in 3 dB increments. So they say then 88 dB SPL would be, you could do that for 4 hours for 100% dose. 91 dB SPL, that would be 2 hours for 100% dose. 94 dB SPL would be 1 hour for 100% dose. 97 for 30 minutes. And 100 dB SPL for 15 minutes. Now, let's just put this into some perspective a little bit. Um, how many of you have ever been to like a big concert in a big stadium somewhere? OK. In most cases, those concerts are, you know, on average, more than 95 dB SPL, easily. OK. Uh, and according to the OSHA standard, now let's say they're, they're 95. And they never go higher than they, they do, right? Uh, but you, that's only, you can only listen to that for four hours, OK? And odds are you may have been in that environment for four hours in a concert, right? Uh, that would have represented 100% of the amount of sound you're able to hear that day uh, without running risk of damage to your hearing. Um, now, in reality, if you, if really loud ones could be 100 or more, uh, depending on where you sit and how loud they are and everything. Now, and that's just the OSHA, but if you look at the NIOSH, which I think is probably a, a, a standard that has a bit more integrity, uh, you know, it's probably, it's, it's, it's pretty safe to say that you were listening to about 97 dB SPL for a few hours. And according to NIOSH, you can only hear that for 30 minutes before you've hit 100% dose for the day. And I'm assuming that for the other 23 and a half hours that day, you were listening to other things, including the other few hours of that concert and the noise of your car as you were driving to the concert and you know your earbuds that you were listening to all day of the CD of the band before you went to the concert. And <laughs> so it's a pretty safe bet that you probably caused some damage to your hearing that day. Yeah? Um, do you know what the average simulation of this was back? Yeah, we're going to get to that in just a minute. Yeah, give me just a minute, and then, then I'll answer that question. Yes? Would you say that, um, co like, the run-of-the-mill, like, concert today, like, might fit, like, they might push it, like, on the loudness level, like, maybe a lot more than, like, we get, because I feel like everything that we hear nowadays, because of, like, the earbuds that are mm -hmm. in the ears, everything is, like, everything is, like, yeah, a little bit because um, it's and it's it's two things. One is yeah, people want to hear that. Hear hear they want it to sound like that, mm -hmm. but also people have damaged their hearing, and so you know, they need it louder, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and we have all this technology now that allows us to deliver it louder than we used to be able to. Right. Um, and you know, part of the reason why it's so loud is 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 they're trying to overcome the noise floor. I mean, you get thousands of people in a room together, they make a lot of noise. And they and you got to hear the music on top of that. And so that's, I mean, it's not that they're being malicious here. They're just like trying to yeah. give a good sounding show that sounds good on top of this noise level that they're dealing with, OK? Um, so I'm not, I'm not here to comment on whether that's right or wrong or good or bad that, that they do that. But they do, right? And you may do that sometime in your career. You know, if you work in sound professionally, you're going to have to do some loud shows here and there. Uh, and you know, you know that, and, and that may happen. But what's important is that you understand uh, what impact that has on, potentially has, on your hearing and the hearing of everyone else in the room. So how can you uh, combat this? Well, you can do this with earplugs. 
Now, there's different, not all earplugs are created equal. <laughs> there are lots of different earplugs that you can buy for all kinds of different functions and reasons. Uh, oh, wait a minute. Hang on. I'm going to change this label. This is foam earplugs. There we go. So this is uh, just an example of two different sorts of earplugs. Now, the, the, the ones on the top are just the cheap foam earplugs that you can get. Probably you all have used these or have even have them. Use them in the scene shop when you're working or whatever. Those, if you shove them all the way in your ear like you're supposed to, right? If you, if you get them all, you're supposed to get them all the way in so that there's not any sticking out of your ear. So if you get them all the way in your ear canal, they, you can get around 30 to 35 dB of attenuation. So everything, the whole world gets about 30 to 35 dB quieter. That's great. Um, the, the issue there is it doesn't do that for all frequencies equally. Okay, So you can see on the graph here, the, the black line is the foam. So zero at the top here, this would be you know, no earplugs in. Um, and you put the foam ones in, the black line, it, yeah, you're, you're attenuating a little more, little more than 30 dB, a lot more in, at the really high frequencies. But this is really not particularly flat, right? Um, it's really, a, you know, the difference between the low frequencies and the high frequencies is 10 dB or so. Uh, and you know from having worn those that it, it's, it's difficult sometimes to function when you're wearing those, right? It's difficult to understand what people are saying. It's difficult to kind of be aware of what's going on around you. Um, things don't sound very good, right? Uh, it's, it's, it's difficult. Now, if you're in a really noisy environment and you don't need to particularly hear anything very well, then by all means, put these in. Uh, they're great. But in most cases, you probably would like to have a little bit of situational awareness, right? And still be able to hear some things and have it sound OK. Well, this is an example of uh, some custom earplugs you can get. I have some of these. I'll show them to you. Um, you. You have to get these are custom made for your ears. You get molds made of your ears, and they make them. And, and they have special filters on them. Um, so here's the little filter. So the filters are, I mean, these are expensive. The filters are about 40 bucks a piece um, if you buy them one at a time. But if you buy them in pairs, you can get them a little bit cheaper. What are those? What's that? What rating are those? So that's what these are. So these are called ER15 filters. Um, now, you can get different sorts of filters for these. But the idea behind these is they, they don't attenuate a whole lot. They just do a little bit. But they also attempt to attenuate all the frequencies equally. It's not, you know. That's a, a lofty goal, but it, it, they're never going to perfectly deliver on that. Uh, so the ones I have are these ER15s, okay? And that's the blue line here. And so on average, they attenuate 15 dB, but they do it pretty evenly across the frequency spectrum. You know, there's only a four to five dB difference between the low frequencies and the, the highest frequencies, the 8Ks or so. Uh, the other thing that's interesting about them is uh, they, they, they are designed to go really deep into your ear. Uh, they try to get up past that second bend in your ear so that they're touching against some of the bones in your skull. And what that does is it reduces this thing called the occlusion effect, um, which is this effect of you being isolated, right? Where it's, it, it's where you hear yourself a little too much, right? It's like your whole body suddenly gets louder, right, when you have your plugs in. Um, and this uh, helps with that because these will go deep enough into your ear that the ends of them touch that bone in your in your skull, uh, and it absorbs some of that vibration <laughs> of your body that makes your, you you hear yourself and all of your body functions much louder. So it reduces the amount that you hear yourself that you normally would with earplugs, and it doesn't reduce the sounds around you as much. And the extent that it does reduce them, it only reduces them about 15 dB. So that's pretty slick, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and there's different filters, right? So you can get the ER9s. I've got some of those, too. I don't actually like them very much. Um, they're, uh, the, the high frequency response of those is about the same as the 15s, but it's really the lower frequencies that it doesn't do quite as much. So 9 would be, on average, it's a 9 dB of attenuation. You can also get 25 dB filters for these, which are not as flat as the 15s, but they're certainly more flat than the foam, and they don't attenuate quite so much. So that's one example of something you can get. Uh, now, you know, those foam earplugs, you could buy a box of a thousand of those for 50 bucks or something, right? <laughs> and have them for, and, you know, you could just use them once and throw them away and maybe have them for years, right? <laughs> now, these 
custom musician's ear plugs. I mean, the one, the ones that I bought, bought was most. I just got a new set of them a year ago. It was about 150 bucks, um, which is a lot of money. Uh, but something to put into perspective is that yes, that's a lot of money. But the fact they sound okay, right? I can wear them and still hear everything, and music still sounds fine. The world still sounds fine. I can still communicate with people. Uh, and, and, they're, and they're very comfortable because they're custom molded to my ears. And so I will wear them more often. <laughs> and so, yes, they're maybe not as effective as the foam ear plugs, but I will wear them more often than the foam ear plugs, and therefore they will protect me better. Okay? And if you put that, that you know, 150 bucks, I, you know, the first pair I bought, I bought like back in 2009 or something like that. And then I bought a new pair a year ago. 2016, so how many years is that? 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, seven years. So I got seven years of use out of that set. The only reason I changed them is I lost some weight, and so they didn't quite fit quite so well in my ears, so I had to get a new set. Um, I probably could have used them for longer than that. But so let's say, on average, you have to buy a new pair of those every 10 years. Let's just be generous. New pair every 10 years. 150 bucks every 10 years. Your career is going to be 30, 40 years. So you know, you're talking about $600 that you're going to spend on custom musicians' earplugs over the course of your career, as compared to, you know, let's say you do this for 40 years, and you know, let's be really conservative and say you're going to make an average of $60,000 a year over the course of your career. That's you'll probably do better than that, but uh, let's just say over on the app, that's how it'll average out. You'll start out less than that, but you'll end up more than that. Okay, so. On average, sixty thousand dollars a year. So sixty thousand dollars a year times forty years working. Uh, two point four million. So yeah, about two and a half million bucks, right? That you might make over the course of your career, being conservative and, and average, right? As compared, and six hundred dollars that you could of that money you could spend to ensure that you actually get to do the job for that forty years, as opposed to having to retire ten years sooner. Uh, and miss out on that five hundred thousand dollars worth of income. Uh, well, that's six hundred dollars over the course of your career is not such a huge investment. It seems like a lot of money now because you're all poor and paying for tuition and all that. And I get that. Okay, but someday, when you're in a position to do that, it's it's worth the money. Okay, so it's it's worth the money is what I'm saying. There are other options though. So that's like this is, this is the Cadillac, right? Uh, there's even something better than that, like the Ferrari, I would say, and they're uh, electron. They have electronic versions of these, which this company, this is the, it's Edimotic Research, makes these, and they they want me to buy some so bad. They keep emailing me, uh, saying, you know, we'll let you try them free for a month, and then if you don't like them, you can just send them back. But they're like 300 bucks, and they have batteries, but they're like kind of reverse hearing aids. So you put them in your ears, and they have like really good microphones on them and really good balanced armature drivers. Um, and they have built into them the um, algorithms for noise exposure. And so it knows sort of how loud the world is around me. And it will, you know, in real time, attenuate according to how much noise I'm exposed to. So if I'm in an environment that's not harmful, it just lets the sound pass through unaffected. But as the, you know, the noise gets louder around me, it will attenuate it more. Very cool. Just live with one in. They're very cool. I mean, like. <laughs> So cool. <laughs> it's, it's freaking headphones that have those built into them. Yeah. So I mean, it's awesome. But they're three hundred bucks, and I can buy two sets of musicians' earplugs for that. Um, and I like the musicians' earplugs actually, and I and I like that I don't have to put batteries in them. Or anything. Anyway, but but that would be like the Ferrari is is the actual active uh, musicians' earplugs. Still, still not. You know, in the grand scheme of things, not. A whole lot of money, but you know I'm happy with these, and they they meet my needs, so I'm not too worried about it. Uh, so here's some other options. Uh, this same company, Edimotic, and I, I, I'm I'm plugging their stuff here just because I like it. There are other options out there, and I I would happily show you know show you the uh, similar products from other companies. Um, I'm just showing you these because these are the ones I've had experience with, um, and so I know that they work. Okay, um, so these are ones that they make. Um, for kind of you know the budget conscious people um, who might not be in a position to spend $150 on some fancy earplugs right now, um, so these ones the ETY plugs they they'll run you about 12 bucks, 
And the ER20 ones will run you about 20 bucks. Um, so they're, they're not custom, obviously. Uh, they're, they're, you know, it's kind of, they have two sizes, uh, one for small ear canals and one for big ear canals. So whichever you are, you just buy that size. Um, and they do about a 20 dB attenuation. So this is their gr the graph for those. So the dotted line is foam earplugs if you like put them all the way in like you're supposed to. That's where you get your 30 plus dB. Now, a lot of people, they, in order to sort of combat that sort of isolation, they, they'll just like stick the earbuds or the, the earplugs barely in their ear. So it gets a little bit quieter, but not quite so much. If you do that, this dark black line is basically what happens is you just basically destroy the frequency response, right? So that the high frequencies go way down like by 20 dB, and the low frequencies go down just a little bit. And so everything sounds weird, but you can sort of hear what's going on. Whereas uh, these two different things, the, the Eddy plugs and the ER20s, um, they don't do that. Like you put them in and you get a reasonably flat. I mean, this is plus or minus 8 dB or so. Um, so still relatively flat frequency response, uh, and you're not totally obliterating the sound. Uh, like you would know. I know I carried a set of these Eddie plugs for years. Um, before I got my first custom set, I had those little ones, and they were fine. I put them in all the time. They sound great. I mean, you can listen to music, and it sounds just fine. Um, you can still hear things. You can still talk to people. It doesn't have that cool trick where it reduces the occlusion effect. You still kind of hear yourself quite a bit, um, which can have impact on you know, noise exposure, right? <laughs> if you are producing a lot of noise, like if you're a singer who is singing really loudly, you're going to sound a lot louder to yourself, and that could be a problem. But, uh, but this is a great sort of first solution, right? Um, that isn't the foam earplugs that just block out the world. And like I say, you can get these for pretty cheap. Um, those those ETY plugs that are just fine, uh, twelve bucks. They last a long time. I had mine for a, a while, several years. And they just come in a little thing, a little pouch, you put them on your keychain, and you always have them with you, and you just stick them in whenever things get loud. Um, I think the ER20s, I think you can actually uh, swap out the tips on them a little bit, I, I believe. I haven't ever, I haven't, these are relatively new, so I haven't tried them before, but um, I think that's one big difference is, is you can put different tips on them, like you could put foam tips on them if those were more comfortable to you. Um, and they're a little bit more expensive, but still, Reasonable, right? Not, they're not going to break your your budget probably. Um, so let's take a look at now what impact this would have on these charts. So if we look at, and I'm going to use those ER15s as a standard, that because they're, you know, that's the ones I use, and and so these are the kind of the ways I tend to think about this stuff. Um, so it, you think, well, it's only 15 dB. What's you know, that's really not a whole lot in a really noisy environment. So yeah, but what impact does that have on the chart? Well, um, if you use the OSHA standard, what 100 dB, which used to be something you could only really be exposed to safely for, for two hours, well, now you could, you could be in that environment for more than eight hours, right? It's, they don't even have data on whether that would be, I mean, it's, it's, off the, it's below the chart. It's 85. They, they, don't, they don't start regulating until you get to 90. So that 15 dB makes a big difference. Suddenly, you go from an environment you can only spend two hours in to an environment you could theoretically be in most of the day and still be hearing a lot of stuff and it's sounding just fine. Um, 105 dB is now that your new eight hour duration. And 105 dB is pretty loud. That's a pretty loud situation to be in. Uh, now, if you use the, the better, what I think are the better standards, the NIOSH, well, now you're looking at, you know, that it's 94 dB now that you could be in. Used to be only an hour. Now, again, all day, you'd be fine. Uh, and it's not until you get to, well, I guess really, I didn't make this one green, but you could, 97, you could still be in there and still be safe. Um, it's really not until you get to an environment that's 100 dB, which according to them is you should only really be in for 15 minutes. Uh, and now you could do that for eight hours with only 15 dB of attenuation. So that little bit is all you need. A lot of people think that, well, I've got to like put these foam earplugs in all the way in, and then they don't like that because it sounds so weird, and, and that's why people don't like to wear them. But they don't realize that you don't need to do that. You don't need to block out the world by the order of 30 to 35 dB in order to protect your hearing. 
you can do a little bit and make a big difference. Okay? So uh, that's my recommendation would be that you get yourself a set of these earplugs of one form or another. I mean, if you want to go buy the fancy ones, by all means, go buy the fancy ones. Um, you got to go to an audiologist, and they have to make, you know, they have to fill your ears full of goo to, that'll set and harden so that they can have molds over your ears, and they send that off somewhere, and they'll build you custom ones that fit your ears. Is it a <laughs> it's the same stuff. It's, it's similar to, like, getting your teeth, impressions of your teeth. Yeah, that dentist. was literally the worst experience of my entire life. So they just, they, you know, they, they just, it, they put in a little syringe, and they squeeze it into your ear, and it just kind of fills up, and you just kind of sit there and let it until it gets hard, and then they come and they pull it out. And I mean, it takes about 10 minutes. Um, but you need to in order for them to make the custom mold, okay, uh, for the ears. But you don't have to get those. You can just go get those, those $12 ones or those $20 ones, and you get a, a really good, really deep, reasonably flat 20 dB. So at a 20 dB, uh, you know, you probably you can then, according to the, this standard, you could be in a 100 dB environment all day with those with those 20 dB filters, and you'd still be hearing things reasonably well, uh, flat, reasonably flat frequency response, um, and you'd be fine. So, I would highly recommend that if I were you. Uh, Oh, another kind of interesting thing I forgot to tell you about these guys is uh, they, they're, they're very specific about the, the chamber of air that's inside of, of those. They, they, um, they have to measure the, that air volume when they make the most of it, get it to a very specific thing, because they are trying to resonate the s similar frequencies that your ear canal naturally resonates so that you get that, nat that natural hump at that Two to four k range. So they, they actually one of the when they're making these they have to they have a, a machine that measures that volume of air inside of there and it has to be within a certain range, or they have to remake them because they're that's the other thing is that that's why they sound so flat. It, partially it's the filters, but the other part of it is they they they're very careful about the amount of air that is is able to fit inside of that earplug um, to mimic that response of your hearing. So there's quite a bit of science that's going into this uh, to figure this stuff out. Um, uh, some you, as I said, you can get little devices that um, will measure these doses for you. Um, I'll show you the one from from these guys um, from Edimodic. Oops, I think I'm out of slides. Yeah, I am. Okay. Um, so this is that company I've been showing their stuff. And again, I'm not, you know. Please don't construe what I'm saying to tell you that you have to buy this product. <laughs> I'm not telling you you have to buy any motor. I'm just saying these are the ones I've used and I like them. Okay, okay. I'm not. I, I'm not getting a kickback from them. For if you go buy their earplugs, I don't get a percentage or anything. I'm just saying I like them, um, and they're nice. Uh, so uh, they also sell these these interesting little things called personal noise dosimeters. Uh, and it's just a little thingy that you sort of clip onto you, your body somewhere, and you wear it throughout the day, and it uses, and you can plug in whether you want the OSHA or the NISH standard, and it will measure your dose, your noise dose, <laughs> and it will alert you when you've hit 100%. <laughs> so if you're just curious, like, a day in my life, an average day in my life, what, you know, what is the average noise dose that I'm exposed to? Uh, this will tell you. Now, it's obviously not going to be able to tell when you've got your headphones on. Um, so that could throw off the, the average quite a bit, actually. Uh, but that's kind of cool. Uh, and that, this is useful, again, for these regulatory organizations if they're going to try to regulate a business and their noise exposures and things, they might clip one of these onto one of their employees while they work in the factory through the day and say, all right, by the end of the day, let's see. Oh, wow, you were at a 2,000% dose today. <laughs> That's not cool. And so they, they would try to do something, but they say, we need to somehow reduce the noise in this environment or we need to put provide hearing protection for everybody or whatever to get them down. Uh, you can get apps on your phone that do this, though. So I've got an app on my phone. Uh, it wasn't free, but it was pretty cheap. It was like five bucks, I think called Sound Meter Plus. Um, I'll see if I can pull it up here. Um, this 
to be up here. Oh wait, no, it would be on the iTunes store. Yeah, here it is. So it's this guy. Um, so what's cool about it is it, is it, just, it has like a built-in kind of SPL meter, but it also has a noise dosimeter. <laughs> so you can see this thing here. It tells you, um, and you can tell it which standard you want this to use, but it'll kind of say, uh, it'll t tell you your actual dose based on you know, the whole however long the app's been running. But then it'll also tell you projected dose. Like if you stay in this environment the rest of the day, <laughs> this will be your dose. So in this case, it's a 740% dose. Um, so I use that app all the time. If I go into a little environment where I'm like, this feels kind of loud to me. Like how, how concerned should I be? Uh, I just whip this thing out real quick, and I put it into um, you know, dose mode, and I just let it run for uh, 30 seconds or so, and it tells me real quick if, I <laughs> if it's a problem. And I'll say, all right, I'll just put the earplugs in, and I'll be good to go. Uh, I mean, I've been known to wear earplugs at Portfolio Review, for example, uh, up in DMP, because you get in some of those rooms, and you get all those people talking at one time, and it gets really loud. Uh, and gets in, gets it, it gets somewhere onto this chart. <laughs> you know, it's 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 probably somewhere in this in the 85 or 88 range, but it's on the chart, and it's the end of the day, and I've already listened to a lot of things that day, so, you know, I I put my earplugs in. What about on an airplane? Definitely. <laughs> yes, measure the airplane next time you're. Have you have the app on your phone? Because I because I was wearing mine on the airplane like the last couple times. Yeah. I wear mine on the airplane all the time. It is loud in there. I wear mine when I drive, actually. If I'm going to be driving on the highway for a long period of time, um, I'll put my earplugs in uh, because it's just that's a lot of noise. Mm -hmm. um, and like when I'm commuting, when I'm doing a show down in Charlotte or something, I'm commuting back and forth from Charlotte for a couple of weeks, but I'm going down to Charlotte to then have to be a sound designer. I don't want to start the day off <laughs> having already fatigued my ears from all the road noise. Uh, and so I just put my little, my custom little earplugs in, and I listen to my audio book. Uh, I, I can crank it up a little bit to get it up above the noise, and it's still perfectly safe level and good to go. Uh, yeah. So definitely, I mean, here, here's the other thing you've kind of got to get over, okay? You, for some reason, there is some implied social stigma <laughs> associated with earplugs. Yeah. I don't know why. You're a nerd. But nerd. listen. Like this is, this is your life. This is your career. This is you know. Who cares? You know? <laughs> also, being able to hear in general is pretty cool. Yeah. So. Especially for somebody who makes their living doing that, right? So, listen, I put mine in all the time, <laughs> and sometimes people ask me, "Oh, what are you wearing in your ears?" And I say, "Oh, it's just my earplugs. It's a little loud here. It's fine. I can hear you. We can talk. It's fine." Because <laughs> I have good earplugs, right? I can have a totally. More of them have conversation. I can hear everything going on around me. It's just like I just turned a little volume knob down on the world. Okay. Uh, so again, if you get nice earplugs that can do that, then you'll wear them more often, uh, and you'll be more likely to wear them. So basically, like the moral of this is, your earplugs don't need to bring everything down. No. A ton. It's just like you just, just need a little bit. Little bit a little way. bit goes a long way, a very long way. Um, but yeah, I can I can kind of show you. Uh, again, this is not um, an in, uh, uh, endorsement, you know, for profit here. I'm not, you know, <laughs> I don't get a kickback off of these guys either. But this is Earplug Superstore, and you know, if there's an earplug that exists in the world, these guys have it. Um, uh, and I would look for. I mean, there's ones for like shooting. If you if you uh, go hunting or you, you shoot handguns or rifles a lot, you know, now a single gunshot in your life is not going to destroy your hearing, but, you know, that your, your ears will protect you from, from that. But if you're sitting there over and over and over again with, a, with like a rifle up against your ear and you're shooting it over and over and over again at a range and do that once a week, well, yeah, that, that will cause some damage. Uh, so you, but you can get uh, earplugs specifically for shooting that have um, filters in them that sort of do nothing 
for quiet sounds, but they respond to really loud impulses like that. Is that really loud impulse will, will seal off that, what, that membrane inside the earplug so that the, the actual you know, impulse of the gunshot gets attenuated, but everything else doesn't. Um, and that's a passive thing. But they also make electronic versions of that too. But there's, you can get passive ones that do that. But I would go to the musicians' ones, uh, and there's you know different you know here's the the custom molded ones, but here's what they call universal fit ones. Th these are ones that are you know you're, they're not custom jobs, but uh, but they work. Um, so some of these are better than others. Um, but you know here's an example. Let's see. So here's some that are uh, uh, 18 dB ones. 18 dBs that are you know relatively flat response, um, so a little bit less attenuation than the the ER20s, and they're they're a little bit um, they come with a little keychain. Look at that, you can put them in, and they're just kind of they're they're short, so uh, they don't like stick out very far. So if you're worried about that social stigma, most a lot of people won't notice them. Um, and you can get a set of those for 10 bucks. Uh, let's see. Can you, would you look up the ones that I have and see? Yeah, what ones do you have? They're called Dubs. And these are, I guess you just Google it and probably get something. Dubs. Earplugs. So that one here. Are these active or passive? I actually don't know. Like, they, you have to charge them or put? No, 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 passive. Okay. So Um, let's see. What do they do? Well, they're sure not telling us all. This is the other thing I like about the Edimotic ones is they actually yeah. will tell you what they're doing. Oh, here we go. Oh, yikes. So choose color to match the way the ear sensitivity kind of changes the levels or signal. So they 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 claim to be um, dynamic, uh, but that that graph worries me a little bit. Um, if that's really what they're doing, but they're, they're claiming that they can that they that the response changes depending on the loudness. Um, I'm not. Right, we'd have to get this that, yeah, this whole thing. I don't. We'd have to read this whole thing. Um, so they, they apparently have uh, two different ways through them. One that deals with low frequencies, and one that deals with high frequencies. Um, so here's those equal loudness contours that I showed you before. There's that. Yeah, I don't know. I'm. I have to read some more about that to see, but mm. they might be fine. That's the one, yeah, that's what I've been using. I mean, if they sound okay, then it's the only ones I've ever tried. Yeah. So I don't really know if they're different. Yeah, I've never heard of them, but um, but maybe they're fine. I don't know. Um, so for example, let's see. So here are those ER twenties that I was showing you. You can get a pair of those, like 18 bucks on this site. Um, here's some NR15s, so 15 dB musicians' plugs. Um, they say 20 dB average, but the noise reduction rating is 15. Um, those are 25 bucks, a little bit more expensive. So there's all kinds of different ones here that you can do. Yeah. But look for these. Wait, look, musician earplugs. Those are the ones I would look for. And you know, I wouldn't. I would try to stay away from something that's any more than a 20 dB attenuation, because much more than that, you might as well be putting the foam ones in. Uh, so stick with 20 dB or less. I, I, the 15, I think, is the sweet spot for me. Mm -hmm. um, that's just about most environments. 
if you just turn it down 15 dB, you're fine. Yeah, the ones that I, I got these like two years ago because of like the, I just looked them up and yeah. I was like, oh, these look good. I've worn, I, I've worn my 15 dB ones at concert, really loud concerts before and been fine. Still sounds great. I can go home without my ears ringing. Um, and it's fine. So. OK, any other questions? Well, that's all I got then. So uh, on Friday, meet me up at the Pierce Building by my office. And I'll give you each a hearing test of your very own. Because the whole point of hearing tests is that you have to do more than one of them, because you want to track changes over time. Right, so we can at least give you. I, and I'm not a, an audiologist, or a, you know, I, but I have. We bought an audiometer, and you can do it, and it's it's reasonably well calibrated, so you can trust it. But I have one question. yeah, uh, when you're talking about the hearing test that you took earlier uh, in the 2007 versus 2016, yeah. did you have that same drop in your left ear as well as your right, or mm -hmm. just your right? Just right ear. Okay. Yeah, which is what's baffling about it. So that's why I'm trying to think, what am I doing that my right ear hears differently than my left ear? Wow, that's really strange. Yeah. OK, so I think that's all we got for today.